prayer. Our precious Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this time that we have come together on this Lord's Day, Father, to worship you. We ask, Father, that you bless all that are here, those that couldn't make it today, those that are suffering, whatever their needs, Father, that you know what they are, and our own individual petitions, Father, for we do struggle through life at times, Father. We ask, Father, that all the things that are said today are according to your will, and that everybody will look at the, the teachings of today and compare it to your word, for the presenter is human and does make mistakes, but that we can always validate things through your word, Father. We love you. We're so thankful for Jesus, and it's because his great sacrifice and great love that we have hope of eternal life forever, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. So good morning. Today, I'm sorry you got me, but I do have some Pepto-Bismol for anybody who, you know, might need it. So just kidding. So today we're going to talk about a topic, the Holy Spirit. And so it's a topic that it seems like we sometimes stay away from, like it's uh, mystical or scary. And it really should not be scary because the Bible just reveals so much about the Holy Spirit. And if we were to cover a large amount of it, we probably wouldn't get to the Lord's Supper to about 10, 11 o'clock tonight, but we're going to try to do what we can, as best as we can. Um, first of all, the word spirit is used 456 verses in the Bible, of which 505 times, oh, we don't need that yet, oh, but you can put it up there if you want to, but that's, yeah, that's fine, okay. We're going to make applications in a, in a little bit about that. Um, in the a New Testament, the Holy Spirit is used 89 times. In the Old Testament, there are three Greek words that was used for the Holy Spirit. The most common was rosh, R-U-A-C-H. In the New Testament, of course, the translation from the original Greek is ghost. And, you know, obviously... The King James Version, which is one I can never understand, um, especially because I don't understand, uh, you know, that old English. And, um, uh, you know, it uses uh, really two, time, two words. Uh, one word is only used once the whole time, but the main word that is used is pneuma for, this, for a ghost. And that occurs almost every time, and it means a current of air, a breath, or a breeze. The only other word that's used for ghost is in Matthew 14, 26, which is phantasma in the Greek. And that's only used once. And that's when Jesus was walking on the water, a big storm, when uh, the, the apostles thought they were going to die. And, they, you know, and, and that, that particular word is not used in ghosts like what we think today, like Casper the ghost or poltergeist. You know, it's actually uh, used in the term of an appearance to make apparent, to appear, to make visible. Now, we're going to concentrate some on the Holy Spirit. and, I, and We're going to do some quick, um, I guess, housekeeping because fortunately, we, you know, we have a lot of mature Christians here. So a lot of the stuff I, I'm going to say, you probably already know, but we do have live stream and we may have some guests and sometimes we have some recent Christians that may not understand this concept. So we're going to review some of this quickly before we get into our main um, topic. Some of the names that are used for the Holy Spirit in the Bible is Comforter, the Spirit of Life, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Grace, the, sp the Spirit of Glory, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Eternal Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of the Living God, my Spirit, His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and I have scriptures for all these, the Spirit of Holiness, the Spirit, the Spirit of our Father. Before we go on, on some of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, we need to touch on the Trinity because it's a very important topic. And um, I know most people here understand it, but the, is, is there any, uh, is the, does the Bible actually have the word Trinity or triune? Is that in the Bible? No, right? But the concept is all over uh, of the Trinity. And, and the Trinity means that there's three divine persons with the same nature. As I was preparing this, this lesson, one of my colleagues at work who's Syrian Orthodox, you know, very nice guy, he's a new colleague, 
really nice guy. He says, what are you working on? I said, I'm going to be uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit. And he says, oh, and our church it means there's one God with three personalities. I said, really? I said, the Bible doesn't teach that, does it? He goes, well, the, our church teaches that, teaches that. What I gave him, and there's many that we could use, but I gave him two main examples in the Bible. How do we prove that? Of anybody, well, the, the, one of the ones that I really used was in, in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. When Jesus was ba baptized and came out of the water, we saw all three of the, uh, of the um, persons of, of God present. Jesus comes out of the water. He's on earth. The Holy Spirit descended down on Jesus as a dove. And out of a cloud, God in heaven says, this is my beloved son who I love. And so we see in that, in that case, and there's many others also, that the Great Commission, you know, relates to baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? One and one and one is three, not one and one and one equals one. That's bad math, you know. Um, we see that the, while it's not said triune, the concept is all is, is, is in there. So we know that it's, you know, three divine persons with the same personality. What are some of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, all the deity is given in a masculine form. And uh, I'll just give you a few scriptures. John 14, 26. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall speak, that he speak. And he will show you things to come. So we know it's a masculine form. I know this is really easy review. We're going to get to some more interesting stuff soon, but it's a very important concept for those that may not have heard it or not sure. The Holy Spirit has feelings. In uh, Romans 15, verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit can grieve. Ephesians 4, 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Romans 8.27 Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of the God. And he has a will. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12.11 But one and the same Spirit works with all these things distributing to one individually as he wills. So the question is, what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, there's so much that is said about the Holy Spirit and what it does, and some things is what it has done that doesn't do now. And just as a, a, a little, just a, a little review of some of them, the Holy Spirit uh, strives with men, Genesis 6:3. Holy Spirit teaches, Luke 12:12, 12, 12. bears witness of Christ, John 15:26. Guides, speaks, and hears, John 16, 13, and 14. He commands, Acts 8, 28, and 13, 2. He directed missionary efforts in the early church, Acts 16, 7. We recall that Paul and Silas wanted to go to Asia Minor, and the Holy Spirit sent them to Macedonia to uh, convert you know, the, the Greek in Europe. You know, so he... Uh, Direct missionary efforts. He speaks. He makes intercessions. He searches the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.9. He justifies and sanctifies. He distributes spiritual gifts or distributed spiritual gifts at the time. There are many others that we can say, but what are some of the things that we can do to the Holy Spirit? There are things that says that as a Christian we, we can do to the Holy Spirit. We can blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and that's a very interesting one that I don't think we're going to have time to today, but the Holy Spirit could be lied to, Acts 5.3, can be tested or tempted, can be resisted, Acts 7.51, Holy Spirit could be quenched, and the Holy Spirit can be despised by people. Any uh, comments or anything before we go on on this? Anybody need Pepto-Bismol yet? <laughs> so, 
okay? All right, so one of the, my favorite chapters in dealing with the Holy Spirit uh, is Romans chapter 8. There is so much about the Holy Spirit that we can learn in Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit has, there's so many other chapters that, uh, places where the Holy Spirit we can learn from. But chapter 8 of the Holy, uh, of, of um, Romans uh, ha- talks about the Holy Spirit 21 times in that chapter. The Spirit is mentioned 21 times. And, um, but before we, you, you, you can get into the uh, chapter 8 of, the, uh, of Romans to understand what is trying to be said here, you have to go back to, to Romans 7. Because remember, we can't take things out of context. Things have to, to uh, be in accordance to what was being said and, and what, what the context of the um, writings are. In Romans chapter 7, Paul is discussing how inferior the old law was and how there was condemnation condemnation through in the old law, which Romans 8, 1 says that for those that are in Christ, there's no condemnation. Let me just read um, Romans 7, 16 through 20, because there's a couple points here we're going to get to later on when we actually talk about what the main thrust of this lesson is. So I do have my phone here with uh, the Bible in here, because some of this is going to be faster through the phone, but I have this one out because I'm still kind of old school here. But if we go to Romans chapter 7, read with me uh, 16 through 20. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law that is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present for me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not, will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. We feel like that sometimes, don't we? I mean, sometimes we know what we should be doing, and then we know we get tempted, and we just do the opposite. Or sometimes we don't do what we know we should do. So in, in context of this, to go into chapter 8, we see that the first, first through 17 verses of chapter 8 is really a contrast of the flesh versus the spirit. In verse uh, 18 to 27, it talks about the suffering in the present times and the creation groans with labor pains, with birth pangs, which is signifying the decay of the world because of sin, right? The whole world, including man and the universe, is decaying, going through entropy for you all that are, you know, understand science, which I'm forgetting it all. But, you know, uh, that the world, because of sin, is decaying, right? And we know that. We know it's all going to go away one day. And then in 18, in in, uh, the last uh, end of the chapter, 28 to 39, we see that there's victory in Christ. So that's kind of like a summary of, the, of, the, uh, of that chapter. There are several topics that are discussed here in chapter 8, and I'm going to go through, just, just label a few of these. If we had time, obviously we can expand on every one of these, but it certainly would take a, a lot longer. But men can walk after the Spirit. The Spirit has a law. The Spirit is connected to life. Christians are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, Romans 8, 9. This is all from, just from, from chapter 8. The spirit dwells in God's children. If one does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit raised up Jesus. We too will be raised by the spirit. 
Through the Spirit, we're mortified the deeds of the body. Through the Spirit, we mortify the deeds of the body. Sons of God are led by the Spirit. We have not received the spirit of bondage, 815. We have received the spirit of adoption, also 815. The Spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God, 816. Some had, the, some had the first fruits of the Spirit, 823. The Spirit helps our infirmities. The Spirit makes intercessions for us, 826. The Spirit has a mind, which we had already talked about. That's not, when we get to talk about some of this, it's, it's not to get so caught up in the in minute details. But one of the, the summaries is that there's no condemnation for those that are uh, in Christ that the Spirit will raise our mortal bodies one day and we're glorified with Christ. And then Paul ends that chapter, of course it wasn't written in chapter form, with two really great scriptures and verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Those are excellent. That's a very good study. But remember, you have to keep in contact with, with chapter 7 because he's contrasting the two. Okay, now we're going to get into what I, the thrust of our lesson is going to be, and that's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's a, a, a really good topic. You know, I think it's, you know, um, I'm not going to say controversial, but we kind of stay away from it. You know, we're going to see in a moment that there's uh, four possibilities, of which really only two, and in my opinion, one, makes sense. But there's no doubt that the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit dwells in a Christian. Let's look at just a few examples. Romans 8, 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead would also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you, not, and you are not your own? Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him. That's for, um, 1 John 3, 24. For now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. The Bible also talks about, and this is just one of a few examples, that not only the Holy Spirit dwells in us, but there's other things that dwell in us, too. And this can be very important when we get into the discussion in a, in a couple minutes, the Bible teaches that God dwells in a Christian. It's not just the Holy Spirit. God dwells in it. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In 1 John 4, 12, no man has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in his. 1 John 4, 25. For whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed that love that God has for us God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So we know Holy Spirit dwells in a Christian. God dwells in a, in a Christian. But what else dwells in a Christian? Well, Jesus dwells in a, in a Christian. That's also biblical, right? John six fifty six. No, I'm uh, sorry. Yes. John 6, 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and will come unto him and make our home with him. So here it says both the father and the son 
those who are Christian. And as a matter of fact, I've got a list here. You know, it's pretty good. I, pro- I wish I probably should have made a copy of it. But there's so many scriptures that says God dwells in Christians. Christians dwell in God. Christ dwells in Christian. Christians dwell in Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in Christians. Christians dwell in the Holy Spirit. And then in John 14, 10, it says the Father dwells in the Son, and the Son dwells in the, in the Holy Spirit. You know, is that trying to say that that's one person? Well, of course not. It's not. But what else can dwell in a, in, in a, in a Christian? Sin. The Bible says that sin can dwell in a Christian, right? Romans 7, 17, which we just read. Now it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. That's what Paul had just said right before we read chapter 8. We know that Satan can enter us in the sense of in prior time. Judah, you know, is said that it's the center that, uh, in uh, Luke 20, uh, 22, 3 and John 13, 27. Then Satan entered Judas, surname Iscariot, who was numbered among the 12. That's, but do we really believe that Satan actually entered in and Judas, the word and the truth can dwell in us. That's something else that can dwell in, 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 in Christians. First Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Second John 2, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. So look at all these things that dwell in us, right? So the question is not, if the Holy Spirit dwells in a Christian, what is the question? And you guys have to answer this or I'm not going forward. How? Yes. How? Yes. And that's, and that's where we're going to get to now. How does the Holy Spirit dwell in a Christian? And before we go there, is there any comments? Joe, do you have any comments? No? No, sir. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting ready to switch to Spanish in a moment here, so... so. All right, so let's look at some possibilities. And I think there's only one that really makes sense, especially uh, we'll get to there. So one of, the, one of the teachings, which is a false teaching here, false doctrine, but it's taught. It's taught a lot in the denominational world is this. The Holy Spirit dwells in the child of God literally, personally, and miraculously. The literal person, the Holy Spirit, is inside one's body. Most who hold this position contend for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, hold that thought, and believe that once the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the believer, that the believer can perform miracles. Okay, this is, we know, is false doctrine. And if anyone believes that, we need to study a little bit more because uh, it, it's really false teachings. Now, as far as we, we could spend a lot more time on that, but I think it's probably important that we just say a word about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because that is used a lot in denomination. Oh, I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized with the Holy Spirit. Anybody want to take a stab at it? If uh, you know, if you want to. Come. Chris, you have a microphone. Hold on. So there's, if I remember correctly, now it's been a while. So good luck. Um, but there's three baptisms you hear about in the New Testament. You hear about the Holy Spirit baptism. You have the baptism with water, and then you have the baptism with fire. Yes. Now the Holy Spirit baptism, which I don't want to spoil the pot, which you're going no, to get fine, into. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Is you know something that was a, a special event that was you know that is, is not repeated. Yes. As, as which you'll be describing Correct. soon, and then we have obviously water and fire, which is a different type. Yes. Of well. And in fact, there's even more. There's a baptism of. Uh, of the Red Sea, and you know, and there's John's John baptism, which is no longer valid. But that's correct. Baptism in the Holy Spirit was fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, and only occurred twice in the New Testament. Only twice, and it was uh, in fulfillment of Joel chapter two, and and I, we don't even have to go. We can, but but Peter in chapter two of Acts refers to it. And I'm, I, I, we're going to just read this for a second. You can either read it in, in, uh, in chapter 2 of, um, of Acts, or you can go to Joel chapter 
2, verse 28 and 29. Let's just talk about this real quick, because this is an important concept, and I know people here know that, but it's important because some people may not. So let's go, see, I can do it on my phone much faster than I could do it over there. Now, is Joel Old Testament or New Testament? Okay, I get that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, so... And I will, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit. The commentary on that is Peter in, in, in uh, uh, chapter 2 of Acts. And so that occurred especially on the day of Pentecost, you know, first to the Jews, right? It makes sense that the Jews got the, the, the initial baptism, the Holy Spirit, to confirm the truth, to prove prophecies. And then occurred to Cornelius and his household when Peter, you know, went to them in, in Acts uh, chapter 10. Same thing happened. The Holy Spirit came to them in a special, miraculous way to confirm that they were part of the all flesh, right? And that's the only time that baptism in the Holy Spirit has occurred that is, that is in the Bible. And, but still, as a note, if anyone were to use it to you, Cornelius and his family wasn't even saved yet, even though they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit first. That was just a sign from God that they're just like you, Jews. You know, you're going to be in my kingdom, Right? They still, at the end, you know, had to be baptized to be in a right relationship, to have their sins washed away. Any comments on that? We could spend more time, but so that you know that, because that does come up at times. So we know that this theory is wrong. It's, it's wrong. The second one is kind of like this, is the Holy Spirit dwells in the child of God in a direct, literal, personal way. He is said to work in conjunction with the word, but it's not working miraculously. The doctrine teaches the Holy Spirit works through the Word and in addition to the Word, outside the Word. The doctrine refers to such things that the Holy Spirit guides, leads, strengthen, protecting, convicting, empowering, producing the fruits, fruit and life of the child of God apart from the Word. They will point to passages of scriptures the Holy, the Holy Spirit works. And it will use stuff like the Holy Spirit brings into remembrance, John chapter uh, 14, 26, which is an interesting discussion we may have. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and whom the Father will send in, in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring you to remembrance whatever I told you. Says Galatians 5.18, we are led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit strengthens us, Ephesians 3.16. This is a, one that's used a lot. As a matter of fact, years ago, when I was, you know, could exercise more than I can, you know, when I used to do martial arts a lot, you know, I had a martial arts teacher who's a great guy. We were still very good friends. And uh, he and some friends, I think I've told this story before, had gone hiking up in, what mountains over there in North Carolina? Is it Appalachian Mountains? Okay, they had gone hiking. I don't remember if it was the beginning of the day, end of the day. There was a beautiful sunrise or sunset on top of a hill. And he said that he just got overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit that day. And that's when he accepted Christ and became a Christian. Well, for, for, first of all, though, though that 1 John 14, 15, and 16 doesn't even, that's not what it means. That was a special uh, instruction that, that, that uh, Jesus said to, to um, to the apostles that do have downstream ramifications for us, but that was to the apostles, and, and, and we may get to that. But again, we see that the Holy Spirit, we, and if there was ever going to be a time where the Holy Spirit converted you without being taught the word, it would have been in the first century, right? And, you know, when all the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit were active, and yet we never see the Holy Spirit just coming into somebody and converting them, and off you go. That's another false teaching. 
Okay, the third one, now this is some, there's some in the, in the church, I think more and more, not so, but some in the church believe, and I would say that for most of my adult Christian life, and, and I didn't become a Christian until my early 30s, I kind of, you know, thought this, I kind of leaned toward this. And now I lean toward the last one, and I'm going to give you reasons why, and you make your, your decisions, and by the way, if, if you don't agree with me, on that, that's okay, you know, this is nothing that's going to, you know, break up the church that we should fight about. I just will never talk to you again, and you're dead to me. <laughs> but other than that, we're good. No, uh, I'm kidding. But this is one that says that the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian literally and personally, but he does nothing apart from the Word of God. Again, the Holy Spirit literally is in the body of the child of God. But they do not believe that the Holy Spirit is operating apart from the addition of God's word. The only difference between this view and the following view, which is what I currently believe, in, and, I, uh, and I'll give you reasons why, is that this one claims that the, the personal inhabitant, inhabitation of, of the body, your, of a Christian's body, by the Holy Spirit. And one of the great church scholars, Gus Nichols. You all remember, well, you know, I I wasn't a Christian then, but he was a a, a scholar, you know, a great preacher in the church, you know, and he he believed this, you know, and and I'm going to read you a little excerpt from a lecture series that he had in the, I believe it was in the 7th, in the 1970, early 1970s. And this is what Gus Nichols says. How much more to remember that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. It is a sobering thought. I believe the Holy Spirit dwells in me really and actually, just as I believe my human spirit or soul dwells in truth and fact. Neither is miraculous. I can't feel either one, nor can either one be found in the Word of God. Neither inspires me with new revelation from God, neither gives me a single idea of religion. The religious truth not found in scriptures. That's a, a quote from what uh, Brother Nichols thought. And, I, and there are others in the church that believe that. And like I said, that's okay. Obviously, only one is true, but that's not a, a, a has to do with revelation or doctrine or stuff. But the last one is the one that I believe, especially the more I have studied, is that the, that the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian by the means of the Word of God. And that the Word is the agent for the Holy Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit actually inhabits the body, but the Word is what um, is the agent for the Holy Spirit. Okay, as we continue, now I'm going to try to prove that to you. And, and, uh, and I'm going to tell you why I believe that. And I will say that I was, most of my Christian life, I believe the third one. And if anyone believes the first or second, we need to talk. You know? but, but the third one, it, you know, any uh, comments as we go on? Okay. We need to make, first of all, we need to make a distinction between a person and a presence, Right? They're two different things. Have a person and a presence are two different things. There's no question that the Bible says that God dwells in a Christian. The Holy Spirit dwells in a Christian. Jesus dwells in a, in a Christian. But we know that God is where? God is in heaven, right? Matthew 5, the model prayer, our Father who art in heaven. It's okay. Okay. God dwells in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. The very last paragraph of Luke and first chapter of Acts, we see Jesus ascending into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus is in heaven. God is in heaven. And, you know, in in Revelation, there's some uh, uh, throne scenes where the Spirit is in heaven. So, if God's in heaven, Jesus is in heaven, 
Why would we think that the Holy Spirit is different? Well, we know some that, that, Jesus, that, uh, uh, that Jesus had told the apostles in, in John 3, 14, 15, and 16, that he must leave in order for the comforter to come. And the comforter will come and direct them in all truth, knowledge, remembrance, right? But what was that about? Was that to us? In a way, you know, down the road in a way, because, because of the Holy Spirit came, you know, he convicted the uh, man, you know, confirmed the word, gave us the word. You know, the miracles occurred to confirm what it was. And ultimately, we have the word of God, right? And so, if we remember in John, the Lord's Supper, or the uh, Passover had just occurred, just finished. And before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he was with his apostles, and he told them this. And then he prayed to God that he could, he could glorify God and, that, and that God and that Jesus could be glorified. And then he prayed for the oneness. He says, just as the Father and I are one, I pray for you disciples, other than Judah, Judas, to be one. And all those that you will make disciples will be one. That was not for, you know, and this is used a lot in, in the third possibility, right? This, I, I've, when I was studying this, this, these verses are used a lot that why the Holy Spirit physically dwells in, in man. I don't think it's saying that at all. Okay, keep that in mind. So, we see that, that the presence of God is found in many places in the Bible where the person is not. You know, remember, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, you know, omnipresent, but he's still in heaven, right? Jesus is still in heaven. And to just give you an example, when God called Moses from the burning bush, he did it through an angel, right? Well, the, God's presence was in the burning bush. God was still in heaven. We see, and this is where we're going to make application to that if we have time, we see in Solomon's temple, we see that, that, and see, one of the disadvantages we have is we have our glasses of 21st century glasses. We don't have the first century glasses. In the same way, like, Revelation seems like it's difficult for us to understand because we don't understand the symbolism in Revelation. We, we have a hard time understanding Ezekiel and Daniel and, and Isaiah. But that first century Christian understood that. When they knew the number system, you know, to us, seven is seven, ten is ten. Not to them. They had an advantage. In the same way, when they talked temple language, they understood the temple. And we see, and we're going to try, if we have time, we're going to make some application. This is very important. We're going to see that God dwelled in heaven. God, uh, pres God's person was in heaven, but he dwelled in Solomon's temple and said he would, yet he was in heaven. Does that make sense? In Matthew 28, 20, in the um, Great Commission, Christ said to his disciples, teaching them, you know, after, you know, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded to you, and lo, I am with you always unto the end of age. So J Jesus said that he was going to be with them. Yet, wait a minute, he just ascended to heaven within 10 days of... of uh, 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 ten, uh, not 10 days, but um, 40, sometime within that 40-day period, right? And we also know as the medium of worship, God tells us when we get together and worship, when we sing, when we take, take the Lord's Supper, God is with us in his presence. But is God physically here? No, he's in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. His presence is here. And by the way, he can be multiple places at the same time his presence can be and still be in heaven. So see, that's the same concept. We see that concept, uh, we see that concept in, uh, uh, with God and with Jesus. And why would it apply any different to, to the Holy Spirit? I don't think it does. I used to think it did, but I don't think it does. Let's look at something else. Any, any comments? Anybody want to throw uh, the hymn, hymnal at me or anything? Go ahead. I think I'm quick enough. We have a, oh, no, we have so much. Okay. Very quickly, um, 
several places in the Bible, it says, God says, seek my face. However, we read that if you saw God's face, you would die instantly. So how can you jive the two? Well, the word used for uh, God's face is presence. I mean, it translated from the Hebrew. We're to seek God's presence, but his physical face we cannot see, and no man has ever seen. Correct. The most, I think, was it Moses saw the back of him? That's about the most anyone saw of God. The, the next concept I, I want to introduce is that, that the word dwelling doesn't always mean to inhabit, you know, the body. It could mean to control or to influence. So when we read dwelling in this sense, don't believe it means a physical presence in you. Let me give you an example. Paul, Paul spoke on how sin uh, dwell in, in him. Remember Roman, Romans 7. That means that Paul was a slave of sin, right? That sin controlled him. That he was motivated by the sin. Not the sin it actually was within his body, but he was controlled by sin. When John spoke of the truth which dwells in Christians in 2 John 2, he's saying that, that the truth that dwells in us is we're controlled by the truth. We're influenced by the truth that is in us. Does that make sense? If we also in Galatians 2.20, let me see if we can go that real quick where, where Paul said that Christ lives in him. Let's see if we go that real quick. I'm sorry, I think we think we don't have a whole lot of time. So if we go to Galatians 2, just this is an important concept because I think this is very. 2 uh, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I've never heard anyone preach, except for Joe. No. I've never heard anybody preach that Paul is saying that Christ is physically in his body. What's he saying? Remember on all, on all the prison epistles, I'm a prisoner, I'm a slave to the gospel, to Christ. He's saying I am influenced, controlled by Christ. Not that Christ physically inhabits his body. And he, okay, so let, let's just see. I'm going to have to skip some stuff. So one of the things we can say is that the Bible often connects deity dwelling with the word. In, in 2 Samuel 23, 2, the spirit of the Lord spoke to me and his word was in my tongue. Proverbs 1, 23, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you and I will make known my words unto you. If the spirit, if John 6, 63, if the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And remember the total armor of God, Ephesians 6, 17. The sword of the spirit is what? The word of God. And if, go to the other list real quick. These are all things that the Holy Spirit is said to do, that the word is said to do. They're almost identical. Right? They're almost identical. The, 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 Spirit, the Holy Spirit witnesses. The Word witnesses. The Holy Spirit instructs. The, whole, the, the Word instructs. They both teach. They both convert. They both begot. You're born in the Spirit. You're born in the Word. You know, born as, of um, water and Spirit. They, they save. The Word saves. The Holy Spirit saves. They sanctify. They justify, they wash, they comfort, they give love, they lead, they dwell in us, they strengthen us, they have power, and they will be involved in the resurrection. Does that make sense? So maybe you all, uh, lots of me, but lots of people are, but have you found something that the Holy Spirit does in man that the Word doesn't? I can't find anything. So it is connected. They're both connected. Look at the, okay. Let me just give you one more. There's a few more topics, but 
In Ephesians 5.18, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Okay, it says to not be drunk in wine, to be filled with the Spirit. How are you filled with the Spirit? Well, Paul answers this in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in what? Same thing. He said in Ephesians, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I'm sorry there was more we could do, but I think I've given you some, uh, something to think about. I was kidding. I will still talk to you. You're not dead to me if you think the other. I, I think as I study it, this is, this is the only thing that makes sense to me. Any last comments? Anybody have last words? Thank you. Thank you.